Will you pray with me? Holy One, come into this space with us this morning. Listen to my words and the meditation of my heart. Let it be pleasing unto you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This morning, I'm reminded of a story about a young mother who had two little boys who always got into trouble. Whatever was happening in their household, anything that was going wrong, the mother knew that it was because those two little boys were up to something, and they were always behind it. So in desperation, the mother called one of the elders of the church, and she asked, would you please come and meet with my boys and see if you can convince them to behave? So the elder came, and he said, I'll talk to one boy at a time. So he took the older boy and sat him down and decided to be as stern and as gruff as he could be. And the elder said, where is God? And the little boy sat there in his chair with his eyes wide and his mouth closed and didn't say a word. So the elder decided to try it again. And he said to the boy, son, where is God? And the child just sat in the chair stared at the elder and didn't say a word. So the elder decided to try one more time, and he said, child, where is God? And the boy jumped out of the chair and ran out of the room and found his brother, and he said, God is missing, and they think we did it. We've been talking about healthy families. We've been talking about connecting to the divine, to deeply connecting to God and to one another. And in creating those healthy families and healthy relationships, we can become curious and create. When I was a jail chaplain, there were about 90 people in our county who used the door of the jail as a revolving door. They would come in, do their time, they would go home, and within weeks or months, they would be back. But once in a great while, one of those folks would make a change so significant that we didn't see them return. They found someone that they connected with. There was someone on the outside, as we say, who loved them and supported them and cared about them. They didn't give them money, but they gave them a job. They gave them value. They gave them self-worth. And once that connection was formed, those inmates became returning citizens who stayed at a different address, no longer using the one at the jail. Those connections are so important if we want to create, if we want to have a family of love, if we want to have a different world. Now we've been reading from the Gospel of John and the Gospel of John is a little bit unusual. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels and synoptic simply means same eye. They have the same perspective. Mark is the oldest and Matthew and Luke borrow heavily from Mark's material. And then they also add in some information from a source that we call Q, which simply means we don't know what that source is. We don't know if it was written or oral. But all three of those gospels have a similar worldview, but the gospel of John has one that is somewhat different. Dr. Ron Allen at Christian Theological Seminary would explain the author of John's worldview like this, that the world is a two-story building or a home with two levels, and God is in the upstairs, and creation is downstairs. So upstairs where God lives, there's lots of light, lots of energy. And downstairs, there are seven billion of us living in the basement. How can we survive? The author of John's Gospel tells us we must connect 
to God. We must connect to the power and the love and the light of God that is upstairs. And once we are connected, we begin to create our own light. So we shine like stars in the darkness. We create light. And when we join together, we create a greater circle of light that draws people naturally from the darkest places. Have you ever been outside around the 4th of July when the lightning bugs come out for the first time? At dusk, a field will light up spectacularly with lightning bugs shining everywhere. Or have you ever been outside at night away from the city lights when you can look up and see the stars? And you can't imagine how many stars there are. Or perhaps you've looked at film or video from the Hubble telescope that shows us how incredible creation is and how many circles of light exist. My friend Mark is a bright light. I met Mark at seminary. He's a little bit older than I am and he is blind, but he was not always blind. When Mark was six years old, his teacher noticed that if he sat in the back of the classroom, he didn't participate. But if he sat in the front of the room, he shared in their classroom discussion. So the teacher suggested to Mark's mother that she take him to the eye doctor. And sure enough, Mark needed glasses. Mark told me how astonished he was the first time he put those glasses on. He had no idea that everyone else saw the world so differently. Now, as Mark grew up, every year, his eyesight grew a little bit worse. But glasses continued to help. He went on to graduate from college, and he became a librarian. You see, Mark loved to read. He loved to watch sports. He loved to go to movies but he didn't feel quite so fond of his family. You see, Mark's parents were very religious. He really didn't have any contact with his biological father, but his stepfather and his mother were a bit verbally abusive. When Mark remembers his stepfather, he said he simply tried to stay out of the path of the angry outbursts. But they did take Mark to church, and they concentrated on obeying the Ten Commandments. And Mark can tell you from memory very quickly the Fifth Commandment. I had to look it up. It's from Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, and it says, Honor your father and your mother, that it may go well with you, and you will dwell long in the land the Lord your God has given you. Mark remembers that one because he didn't want to honor his father and his mother. In our readings this morning that Jim shared with us, there was lots of mention about commandments. One said that obeying God's commands is how we show love to God. And then Jesus, in that gospel reading, told us that if we follow his commands, we will abide in his love. And somehow over the centuries, the church, the universal Christian church, began to concentrate more on those commandments than on love. When Jesus talked about good news, the church more often talked about original sin and how we all deserved to go to a place called hell. When Jesus talked about creating fruit that would last, the church told us about forbidden fruit. When Jesus talked about loving one another, the church told us we could love certain people. But there were others that if we loved them, we would be called abominations. Mark didn't care much for all of those commandments, neither do I. So we remember today that Jesus boils all those commandments down into two. 
love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. In our reading this morning, it says the commandments are not burdensome. It should be easy to follow them. They only become burdensome, I think, when we inflict them on someone else. It's easy to follow just two commandments, and it's also easy to create that fruit that will last. Creation is something that we do all the time. We are always creating. We create how we respond to whatever happens. But most of us do it unconsciously. We get up in the morning, we're on autopilot. We get ready, we go to work, or we go to the doctor, or maybe we sit down to watch our favorite shows. And we wait to see what life will give us. And then we decide if we're happy or if we're not. That's exactly what Mark did for the first 50 years of his life. He reacted to what life gave him. He told me that even when he could see, he didn't see clearly. As he grew older, his eyesight continued to deteriorate, and eventually it was causing him problems at work. So he went from specialist to specialist, at least five, maybe six that he could remember, and no one could understand what was wrong with his vision. His eyes were healthy, yet he couldn't see. He finally went to a medical doctor who found out that his optic nerve had degenerated. The nerve was atrophied. Mark's eyes are perfect. They see everything, but he has no way of telling his brain what he sees. And his blindness became more pronounced, and glasses no longer helped him. Mark was given notice at his job. A blind librarian is not going to be effective. And I asked him, how did you cope with realizing that you were not only losing your eyesight, but you were losing your job, you were losing your life? And he said, all I remember about that time was feeling angry. I was so angry that I was going blind. I was so angry that I had lost my job. I was so angry that life had given me this, and I didn't ask for it. Out of desperation, he moved back in with his mother. And there, he said, he hit rock bottom. He found out that his maternal grandmother had also gone blind, that there was some genetic code that his mother had unwittingly passed on to him that caused that nerve, his optic nerve, to deteriorate. But his mother had never told him even when he was going from specialist to specialist to specialist, trying to understand what was happening, she did not speak of it. Mark said that she never spoke of weakness, and she considered blindness to be weakness. When Mark found out about his mother's deception, he was even more angry. He was in a place of such darkness not just physical darkness, but emotional darkness, and now he knows spiritual darkness. Now creation can start in the darkest place. I know some of you are gardeners, and we put seeds every spring, if it ever warms up enough, into the ground, and we cover it over, and those seeds sprout and we know that in Genesis chapter 1, creation takes place, it says, in a formless void. It says the earth was formless and void and the Spirit of God hovered over the deep. I had a professor at seminary that on a whiteboard he took a marker and he scribbled this big black scribbly mark and he pointed at it and he said, in there. 
is where God creates. The Hebrew for that darkness is tohu bohu. I'm not kidding, it's weird. But those are the Hebrew words that describe formless and void. Now, my parents can explain to us how to create more vines because we're still talking about vineyards and we're still talking about vines in our text this morning. And it's so fascinating to me because they actually prune living branches, 10 of them, and they get pieces about this long. And my mother will say, each branch must have three living buds. And they bundle those branches together so that the cut ends are lined up and they tie them and then they plant them in the ground upside down with the cut ends at the top and they cover them over completely with soil and they leave them in the ground upside down for a year. After the year passes, they very carefully dig up that little space and lift out those branches and they have sprouted roots at the top like hair. And then they cut those branches apart and they very carefully separate them, turn them right side up, and plant them in a row, and they've created 10 more grapevines. Now my parents created, uh, they actually went from seven acres of grapes to almost 44 acres by planting vines in the ground upside down. Mark was in the ground upside down for more than a year. He struggled with his anger. He struggled with blindness. He struggled with being unemployed and having no value. And in the midst of that darkness, he got a phone call from a friend in Illinois. And she invited him to come and live in Illinois near her. She said she would help him find an apartment, get him settled, get him connected to services. And in his desperation, he agreed. He took a risk. He didn't want to stay in that place any longer. He wanted to move forward. He wanted to discover what his life could create. And so he moved to Illinois. And once he got settled, his friend invited him to go to church. Now you remember, Mark didn't have a great relationship with church. He remembered all those commandments and he said he probably broke most of them. So he went out of kindness to his friend. But once he got to the church and he sat in the pew, in the darkness, remember, he's listening and he's hearing a different gospel message. He's hearing a message about love and acceptance, about joy and curiosity and creation, about forgiveness and compassion. And he realized that he had never heard a message like that in a church. And as he sat there week after week, he told me that he felt again this call, this invitation from God to do something different with his life. And so with the support and encouragement of his congregation, Mark went to seminary. He graduated the year after I did, and he returned to Illinois, where he now is Reverend Mark. He is the director of outreach ministry. And Mark ministers to 100 people, actually more now, more than 100 people, not in the church at all. Mark goes to assisted living facilities and group homes and Alzheimer units and nursing homes, and he ministers. Mark is a bright light. But Mark was intentional. Life happened, and he struggled. But when he got that invitation to take a risk and to do something different, to move to Illinois, to go to seminary, he took those risks. He was intentional about creating a new life for himself. I think that God is the best example we have of an intentional creator. Again, in Genesis chapter 1, we read that God created us 
in God's image. And I want to reword that for you just a little bit so you think about it differently. The creator created you in the image of a creator. We were made to create. And in our gospel reading, Jesus said, create fruit that will last. We were made to create light in this world, a light that will last. Now, I've only been here for a week, and I have already realized how many creators we have in this congregation. We have a food pantry, a baby shower. We have showers for the homeless. How cool is that? How many churches offer showers? On Thursday when I was here, someone rang the doorbell, and when I opened the door, she said, Carl said I can come in and take a shower, and I said, come on in then. That is incredible. We have people who write books. We have people who create music and put together choirs. We have people with greenhouses and art studios, and I'm sure as I meet more of you, I will hear more creation stories because St. John's has this rich tradition of creation. This past week, Carl showed me some old pictures of this sanctuary. And if you saw those pictures and then looked today, you would not recognize the place. There was no painting up here of Jesus. There were organ pipes, lots and lots of organ pipes. This front area looked completely different. The railings were different. There was a semicircle on the ground. There were lecterns. The front pews were connected. There was no aisle there. And in the fellowship room, the ceiling was open. It was a balcony so that when people walked in this building, they could look up and they could see that magnificent stained glass window that we don't see anymore. But is St. John's about organ pipes? Is this church about paintings and about pews? Are we about balconies and stained glass? No, we are about being a family of faith that loves and supports one another as we become curious and we create. We are a family of faith that carries the love of Christ out into the community and out into the world. We are a community a faith that loves one another deeply. Was Mark's life about blindness? No. Mark's life is about carrying the light of Christ to the least of these. We could say that Mark was blind but now he sees, and so do we.